Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 430. Is that right? Wow. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 24th of August 2018. It's the Feast of St. Bartholomew. In 1572, one load of Christians in Paris massacred another load of Christians. We've learned to do a bit better since, but we can improve still further. Not much. Wasn't that Protestants and Catholics? Catholics wiped out up to 30,000 Protestants in Paris. Really, really, really terrible. Yes, it was. Okay, we're recording a little late, or no, this is a normal Friday recording. Last week we couldn't record on Friday, so we recorded on Wednesday. And I had to run out to Madison, Wisconsin to visit Mom, who had her 80th birthday. And I got to spend four days with Mom and Dad. About day four, you realized why you moved away. Well, you went off to college, and, uh, but <laughs> that's just, <laughs> I'm sure everybody out there is like, yeah, yep, yep, I, we understand, Kevin, completely. Um, here's a picture of mom and dad on the last day as I was about to fly out with Jill, come back home. Notice in front of them, um, they're both in their 80s. Uh, mom just turned 80. They've been retired for about 15 years, and they're living the good life. I realized, and I can't wait for retirement myself, but you get to have a, a cocktail uh, three times a day. This is breakfast at the local diner, and Mom has, what, is that a Bloody Mary? I mean, it's just the, the, the perfect life. So <laughs> I, I do want to wish Mom a happy 80th birthday. I, I know she watches the program once in a while just to see what uh, her, her son is up to. Uh, Gavin, how are things going? You, you're re I, I know you're not parachuting yet, but how's the hip? Um, the the hip improves every day, and I've I've started walking about two miles now, and it's really so exciting. I drove a car for the first time today. Mrs. Ashenden and I are still in open dialogue about when I can get on my motorbike. <laughs> but <laughs> and uh, so it's it's really improving. Um, I've discovered I can sleep on my front as well as my back, which is exciting, and um, a very a piece of versatile life athletics that I've missed very badly you, so in all in all I'm so grateful you have a completely different situation going on over there in, in your house in London than I do people often see me drink my coffee and uh, uh, while I'm talking to the microphone I have to make my own coffee here it's down in the kitchen I have to add my own cream my own Splenda and bring it up but every time I log on and, and I'm talking to, to Gavin <laughs> Mrs. Gavin comes into the room and he'll, here's your tea, dear. Oh, well, thank you. You know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> where's the, that's, we all want that now. <laughs> and so I'm like very impressed and very uh, uh, pleased to see you guys do it the old traditional way. Um, I, I, I explained, look, we have to put on a show for Kevin. That's yeah, right. So this, is, this is how you do it, okay? Just for the moment, be submissive and helpful with a cup of tea. It'll last 30 seconds. It won't cost you too much. My goodness, it's a good impression. And when you tell me I'll go on the motorcycle, I'll go on the motorcycle. The quid pro quo is I'm off the motorcycle till next spring. <laughs> I hope not. We'll see. Uh, no. So, fun news. Um, there's a... Anybody who pays just a little bit of attention to politics over in uh, England and London and, uh, and Britain as a whole uh, gets to introduced from uh, on occasion to characters. And one of these characters that I've watched uh, with great love and enthusiasm, not for his politics, but for his uh, ability to really uh, mess things up uh, in, in the realm of the press, is Boris Johnson. Uh, he was the uh, he's the ex mayor of uh, London, and he's uh, obviously still involved in a lot of government things. And he, for one reason or another, decided to write about the burqa. Now, you and I have talked uh, on and off for the last couple months about whether the burqa should be outlawed in uh, England or Britain or France and other places. We know a couple of countries have done it in Europe, and he said we don't want to ban it. But boy, these people look atrocious when they're wearing it. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to talk to Gavin about this because you certainly understand that Boris is a character. Well, he is. He's a lovable rogue. He's, um, rogue. he's very. He's, he's very intelligent. But uh, there's a very real possibility he might become prime minister. And I, I, I'm. I myself don't think he's prime ministerial material. But there are a lot of people who do. And th what lies behind this is a civil war in the Conservative Party. But 
Um, it, it also has drawn out aspects of the Church of England's relationship with politics because it, it's like ripples. So the stone has been thrown into the water and there are a whole load of Anglican ripples arrived too because Boris wrote, um, uh, the conspiracy theorists believe he did, he intended to cause all the trouble he caused. He wrote a, a, a liber libertarian article saying, we must not ban the burqa like Denmark. We must allow Muslim women to wear it if they want to. And having spent a large a page of a newspaper saying this, he then said, but goodness, they do look a bit silly. They look like pillar boxes or bank robbers. This is Boris's sense of humor. Now, yeah, one has to say that a, a large number of people on the left, before it became fashionable to love Islam, said the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you can pick out from a whole series of left-wing newspapers people saying exactly the same thing. But yeah, because so, now, your point is valid. Ten years ago, maybe fifteen, the BBC would have said the Telegraph, the Sun. They all would have had the same uh, type of the Guardian, comments. The Guardian yeah, on yeah. down would have said, "There's no way we should allow this in our society." A lot of changes. Well, no, but they also but they, but, but, but they also said these people looked like letterboxes and bank robbers. Yes, right. I mean, I mean, it was it was said across the whole political spectrum. Yeah. But things have become so charged now that when Boris Johnson said it, the media world erupted against him. It forgot, it ignored the fact that he was making a libertarian point, let them wear it, and just hammered on his Islamophobia because to call a Muslim woman uh, in a niqab a, a, a letterbox is, is, clearly a, is clearly hatred. Um, the Church of England bishops... I mean, so many, we can't even name them. Dozens of them leapt into the political fray and they, they were disgusted with Boris Johnson's Islamophobia, this, this letterbox joke. And um, uh, they, they, they showed how sensitive they were to his overt hatred of Islamic culture that he wanted to ban Odia. No, he didn't, did he? However, at the same time as this has been running, there's been another story running. And we, we have Forrest Gump, Otherwise known as Jeremy Corbyn, who might <laughs> the who Jew hater, become, yes, oh, who also might become prime minister. That the fact that we are reduced to Forrest Gump or, or, or Boris the Clown is is just terrifying for us politically. Anyway, Forrest Gump has hated Israel since he was a teenager in the 1970s mm -hmm. and has been a permanent supporter of Palestinian rights. And over the last 30 years, he has laid wreaths at the tombs of the of the Munich uh, assassins who killed the Israeli Olympic team, many of them. Uh, he's a constant supporter of Palestine and is very angry about Israel. Now, you might say, well, so long as he's angry about political Israel, Zionism, maybe that's OK. Uh, and we all know that there is a very complex relationship between the settlers and the dispossessed Palestinians. However, it's in the context of the fact that his Jewish MPs in the Labour Party have found themselves overwhelmed by hate campaigns against them because they're Jewish. So there is within the Labour Party this wave of anti-Semitism, which is probably set up by the uh, Labour Party's courting of the Muslim vote. But whatever they're causing it, Labour MPs are having dog excrement thrown through their letterboxes, they're having death threats from other members of the party. Uh, and uh, they've been complaining and saying, the last time anti-Semitism came to Europe, it produced the Holocaust and Auschwitz. We should be a bit more careful. Now, you would, you, uh, Kevin, I, here's, here's a quiz for you and all our readers. Let us say that um, nobody reads figure, the show. I'm sorry. <laughs> let us say that let us say that three dozen Anglican bishops criticised Boris Johnson in the media for for his hatred of Islamic culture. How many English bishops do you think stood up <laughs> and complained about Jeremy Corbyn's anti-Semitism, given the dreadful shadow that lies across English culture? Anywhere between. Zero and thirty. Take I a zero guess. and zero. I'm going to guess zero because negative wouldn't be fair. <laughs> it was zero, not yes. one, not not one Anglican Church of England bishop decided that this this the, the, the pleas of Jews in the Labour Party and non-aligned Jews in London who are writing saying we don't think London is safe for us. We want we want to leave. Not one has seen fit to to defend our our cousins our older brothers and sisters in the faith, which is the most terrible indictment upon Anglicanism or rather the Church of England in, in Britain today. Well, I'm just guessing here. In America, 
uh, most middle class Jews do vote Democrat uh, to liberal. It's just, you know, the, kind of how they're involved in politics in America. I'm betting in England it's probably too much, di- not too much different uh, that they vote yeah, sure. either socialist yeah. uh, or liberal Democrat. So, which is weird because then they're politically aligning themselves with the Muslims who also vote sh- socialist over in England. Uh, you're, 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 you're quite right. Um, I'm sure the breakdown might be a bit more sophisticated than that because we have a large number of, of Jewish entrepreneurs who are in business uh, and, um, uh, and some of them will undoubtedly vote for more liberal policies from the right. But absolutely, there'll be a large number, especially progressive and liberal Jews and, and secular Jews who would vote on the left. After all, Karl Marx was, it, was, um, uh, was Karl Marx Jewish? I've just forgotten. Karl Marx. I've had a complete, I've had a complete oh. mental breakdown. Oh, heavens above. Kevin, I, cut this bit out. I don't know. No, I'm just, I'm I remember just, Adolf has a cousin who was Jewish, but I don't remember if Karl Marx is not. Well, hold on. I have Google right here. <laughs> Let me get my keyboard. We're not going to mess this up. Hold on. Sigmund, Karl Sigmund. Marx. See, at least I spelled that right. Jewish. He was. I'm sure he was. Um... He was born town of Prussia. Okay. Oh my gosh, we almost had the same old town. Uh, he was ethnically Jewish. Very good. Yeah, you knew it. I just suddenly thought I had this terrible doubt. <laughs> am, I, am I confusing Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud? Yeah. It's been a well, long, been a I, long day. Again. I don't think people out there can appreciate how unscripted this really is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is good, very unscripted. I, I basically have a little print form, and here's the first things I'm supposed to talk about, and I didn't. That's, I mean, I com- <laughs> somehow I, I circled it in red, and I completely missed the like, share, comment, subscribe, and to the answer it about the podcast every week. You know, I, I'll get it in the show at some point, and then we have our three little topics with a couple outlines. The rest is just you and I bantering together, trying to be communicative about stuff we know. But we, we prove we don't know a lot. But you proved you knew about Karl Marx. Um, well, only, I, only just. I had somebody, a friend of ours, did subscribe and uh, sent the show to one of their Christian friends who sent an email saying, why are Gavin and Kevin so obsessed with sex? I think he saw one show. One show. <laughs> 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 and in this one show, he decided we were obsessed with sex. And and uh, I'm, I'm trying to suggest, I'm, I'm trying to work out a p- very polite email that says, actually, on the whole, we think we're responding to current affairs in the Church of England. <laughs> what about sex? <laughs> 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 it's not our fault. That's all the Church of England knows nowadays. Uh, they, they bought into it. There's a couple more. I want to talk about two more things. First, uh, here in America, if we see the... Uh, we're D-E-R-B-Y. We say derby. In fact, we have a Kentucky derby where horses go around a track, and uh, if you're lucky, y- your horse wins. You guys over in England replace the E with an A and call it derby. Am I right? Beautifully done. You say tomato, I say tomato. Tomato, tomato. You say derby, <laughs> I say derby. Okay, <laughs> derby. And so there's a, a cathedral in Derby that, as far as I can tell, has become a porn theater. And I thought we, should, <laughs> we you and I could talk about it because uh, a lot going on. If I remember correctly, the bishop called this the cathedral for all. And he's well, he's a de- it's the dean. The dean, the bishop I'm sorry. Stayed quiet. The dean, of course, he has. Isn't the, this is a <laughs> dirt? Isn't this where uh, Justin Welby came from? Uh, no, that I was... don't think it, he was dean of Liverpool. Liverpool. Uh, if that's what you mean. Oh, okay, that's right. Uh, where was he bishop? So of? The, uh, he was bishop of Durham. Durham. For that's about it. Five my fault. Sorry. Dur- 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 I, see, I see what you mean. It begin I with D. It's, I know. It's you know on a Friday. That's it's all I can. Beard. That's just how my brain works. It networks D D uh. D. That's right. Durham. Okay. So this is Darby, and uh, they've been showing some very pornographic type videos. He's been talking it up about how this is the key cathedral for all. Um, he's obviously the dean for all. I thought we could talk about this. The dean of Derby has decided that. He wants to bring more people into the cathedral. Now there are ways of doing this, Kevin. There are one of the one of the, the time honoured ways is talking about Jesus and baptizing people who respond. But the, the dean of Derby has decided to take a shortcut, and so he has said his name is the Reverend 
Dr. Stephen Hans, or as you would say, Hans. <laughs> uh, and here's the, 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 to rhyme with pants. Yes. The first thing we are trying to do is to open the cathedral to new people. It doesn't just belong to the people who go to church. It doesn't just belong to me. It doesn't belong to religious people, whoever they are. Uh, this is Derby's cathedral, and it needs to serve the needs of the people of Derby as wide a range as we possibly can. And in order to serve a wide as range as he can, he's showing two films which involve the celebration of paganism and erotic scenes, scenes so erotic and so sexually explicit that the BBC cut them out when they first showed them on television. Now, a number of Christians in his diocese, have, and particularly church wardens, have said, you know, to do this on a Saturday night and to celebrate the Holy Eucharist uh, eight hours later leaves us with a very strange taste in our mouth. Please don't do it. But the dean is convinced that a cathedral uh, needs to be a uh, uh, needs to double as a cinema, showing exotic films in which paganism and erotic sex play their full part in order to be a cathedral in the Church of England today. Well, I remember having a discussion with a uh, theologian from the Church of England. He's a, he's a, a professor over here right now. And uh, he said, Kevin, I don't think you understand. You guys think of Anglicanism and the church much different here in America. Over in England, uh, many of the population and many of the clergy think of it no more than a public library. A place where you just go and if you need it, it's there for weddings, it's there for funerals and baptisms. But all in all, uh, it's just a function of the state. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I thought it was something worth fighting for. There are elements within the church who are willing to fight for it, including the queen. Uh, but other than that, Kevin, uh, you, the way you see the Church of England is not how the Church of England sees the Church of England. I, am I right in that? I think it's true that the, the, the phrase that most distressed me in what he said was his reference to it's not just there for religious people, mm -hmm. whoever religious people are. I, I, the, the, the sorrow is that the, a, a state church is always going to have to decide whether or not it pleases the state and the society it's in or whether it, it proclaims Jesus as Lord and celebrates them, the mysteries of the faith. I, I have to say, in this country, in the last few hundred years, the Catholic Church has, has had a much greater sense of the sanctity of buildings and the role of the cathedral as being the apostolic teaching center of the faith. The Church of England uh, lamentably has found itself um, acting, as you say, like a religious public library. And um, uh, and you have to say, where does it end? I mean, it's, it's not just that it's uh, entirely a misunderstanding uh, the LGBT movement. A number of people thought we may have, may have gone over the top when we criticized, for example, Ely Cathedral last week. One or two Christian commentators pointed out the LGBT manifesto of 1971, which still stands and lies behind the ideology lie behind gay pride, saying, we intend to destroy the nuclear family. That's our main aim. And it's no surprise that through the promotion of gay marriage, uh, that's largely begun to take place. So this isn't just about the destruction of the family and gay sex. Now we have the celebration of paganism uh, and eroticism. And you have to say, at what point does 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 do the do the people in the Church of England say, really, we're about new life in Christ and the life of the Spirit? A few brave church wardens in Derby, in the diocese of Derby, have tried to. Um, but my guess is they won't get very far. So I, 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 I continue to think that um, uh, for as long as the Church of England shows no sign of developing a Christian conscience, it will become a more and more uncomfortable place for people to try and serve Christ in. Now, I, I have to agree with you. Now, I'm also seeing some distress in Ireland. Uh, you and I spoke about what happened in Pittsburgh uh, with the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Uh, last week in probably larger in the whole of all the diocese in the Roman Catholic Church in America, uh, the trouble with pedophilia and um, homosexuality and other issues that have greatly infected the church. Now, I, let me be clear. All denominations have problems. I, we're just we're, we're reporting the news here. Um, I, I see this kind of uh, reaction now in Ireland where uh, the Pope is going to have a tough visit when he shows up there soon. 
I have, I have two views, Kevin. Um, I've watched a few videos of some victims talking about the brutal treatment they received, both in terms of beatings and in terms of rape. And when you see dignified, grown, tough men in their 70s talking about how their wives only just saved them from suicide, how they see at night time the figures of the monks and priests who brutalize them at the end of their bed in their psychic imagination, uh, there really aren't any words to describe the horror. And and um, it, it, is, it is beyond terrible. No, it's, um, it's, it's, to me, it's demonic. You know, well, it's entirely demonic. You know, I mean, but, this is but, uh, a taking down of the structures set up, you know, day one with Peter, you know. Well, yes, and my other reaction was a small postcard that one of my Catholic Facebook friends put up, which said, this is terrible, but, but did you leave Jesus when you met Judas? And the fact is that 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 you know one twelfth of the disciples, that is Judas, b betrayed Jesus. It was demonic. Satan entered him. We're told uh, this is not to make any excuses, but I but I think it is to say that the once one's got over one's one's visceral reaction of anger and grief, uh, and one then begins to ask for some kind of spiritual discernment. Um, the the church is a vessel. And it's a vessel which, which oftentimes, this is this is St. Bartholomew's Day. On St. Bartholomew's Day, the church was corrupted by hatred and a spirit of murder. And, 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 a, and a number of Christians killed 30,000 others. I mean, they killed them. They, they yes. murdered them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the church being the church. This is, this is the holy vessel of the church containing, containing evil. So those of us who know a bit of church history and understand the nature of the church say, well, we have to cleanse the church from evil. We don't destroy the church. The dilemma in Ireland is that people are so angry, so hurt and so betrayed. And one has to say that, that the Irish church, when it was in a period of strength, behaved with such arrogance and such power and sometimes such lack of compassion that you put these two things together and you have an incendiary moment. Now, a number of people have said, if the Pope apologizes from his heart and if he tells us what he is going to do to clean the stables, then we may give Catholicism and Christianity in Ireland another chance. But 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 the, the thing is that um, this this ties back in to not not just paedophilia, but, but again, this complicated issue about where the sexual corruption comes from, because in in um, I think in in the American survey, it turns out that although it's been reported by the press as paedophilia, 80% of the sexual victimization took place by homosexual priests on pubescent boys. Mm -hmm. So this is this is this is not classic paedophilia per se. This is simply rampant homosexualism, which which doesn't have a a cutoff line. And one of the things that the the the, the Pope has to do is to decide whether or not he's going to tackle. The homosexualization, the ghettos, the mafia, the circles, the promotions of of people within the Roman Catholic Church who, since Vatican II, have taken high office, or whether he can't. So this is not just a, this is about evil, but it's also about sexuality. It's got very little to do with celibacy, uh, but it's got a great deal to do with with purging the church and repentance. Has the Pope got the will? I'm sure he'll. I'm sure he'll make the apologies. But does he have the levers of power or influence and the personal conviction to implement the rules of the Catholic Church, which are very clearly that people of a homosexual orientation are not fit to be priests in the church? It's their rule. They just haven't kept it. Well, I have a Facebook friend. His name is Joseph uh, Scambra. And uh, I've certainly been following his uh, postings for a, a while. He's a uh, ex-gay who uh, was uh, in... San Francisco in the 80s and 90s uh, during the horrific uh, uh, HIV epidemic that was going on and he uh, was delivered from his homosexuality uh, through prayer and intervention from his family. Uh, he wrote about this uh, a little while ago and he said, saying that the current crisis has nothing to do with homosexuality is like saying the iceberg had nothing to do with the sinking of the Titanic. There were other factors, arrogance, complacency, um, and he goes on, but uh, you know, the predominant issue within 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church in their seminaries, in many of their deaneries, in many of their uh, dioceses, is the acceptance of um, homosexual and active homosexual priests into uh, their clergy. Well, of course, the, the, the diff difficult thing is, in a way, with, with lustful heterosexuals, mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, with lustful married heterosexuals, uh, when they sleep with someone they shouldn't do, it's adultery. It's really very clear in terms of a category. Part of the problem with homosexuality is that, that um, uh, the, 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 the prescriptions, I, what I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the scale of sexual activity um, makes it difficult to know what you can indulge in and what you can't indulge in. I mean, so I think I think there could be a lot of a degree of special pleading from the beginnings of affection, which which starts a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and a part of the problem is that um, uh, it would be better if we talked uh, not about gay or straight, but but simply about whether you are celibate and chaste or whether you are married. There are two states and sexual activity belongs in the married state. The church has always taught. And it's also understood how, like pride, uh, our sexuality is very powerful and very dangerous. C.S. Lewis has this extraordinary passage in The um, Great Divorce where a, a straight man struggling in purgatory with lust uh, is, is in, the, the angels are inviting him to ask them for help to break the demon of lust on his shoulder. And then a very moving passage, which quite clearly shows a great deal of personal experience by, by C.S. Lewis. Uh, he finally he, uh, asks the angel for help and the demon of lust's neck is broken. Um, and, and then something very strange happens. The, this, this demonic, broken demonic creature transforms on the ground into a white stallion. And the man leaps on the white stallion to escape purgatory and rides on redeemed and transformed sexual appetite into heaven. And what Lewis was trying to explain in this really profound image is that, um, that, that that sexual energy is not bad in itself. We have to be careful how we use it. Sublimated, it becomes part of our the giftedness we offer back to God. But used in the wrong way at the wrong time, it is, of course, demonic. The Catholic Church has to decide in this particular case how clearly it draws the boundaries about uh, about sex and particularly above all whether or not it follows its own rules it would be an astonishing thing if through this great crisis the pope found both the spiritual determination the biblical wisdom uh, and and the the gift of discernment to be able to renew the church a new reformation which involved uh, a a recalibration of sexual boundaries if if that came out of all this suffering well, then there would be things to give thanks for, though. Though you can never, you can never make a direct equation between suffering and redemption. But we we are in so many ways in a period of new reformation. We need not to look back at the issues of 1520 and Luther and Zwingli and Calvin. We need to look today at the issues of of Christian anthropology and sexual identity, and the way in which we deal with power and lust, and. And no, recommit ourselves and absolutely to purified agree. church. You know, and one of the bigger problems is we forgot what we we're called to do. Okay, what we are called for. A lot of people, I'm called to be heterosexual. I'm called to be a father. I'm called to be a son. I'm called to be a great husband. No, the call of the New Testament under Christ is a call to be holy. And we often you know, forget that. In our, in our daily walk, we want to be identified by our sexuality, identified, you know, by you know the denomination we go to, our evangelism, uh, the, the current Bible study we're in, and we, we lose the call to holiness. And, and I think part of this is true because we fail to understand the Old Testament. My daughter came back from university, and we were we were discussing a few philosophical matters, and she said, "Well, you know, the thing is, Dad, this this business about God being all powerful in the Old Testament." And I said, "No, really not." The revelation of God in the Old Testament is a God of purity and holiness and mm -hmm. order right. and actually in hierarchy. He came to purify the people of Israel. The, the law and the prophets, the, the law was the ordering of society so society could be ordered and purified. And then the prophets came and said, look, those are the rules, but guys, you're not holding them. And this is this is why you should and how you do do it. But it was uh, the Old Testament is essentially at heart a, mo a movement of purification of, of both the person and of and of the family 
and of society. But we've been infected by a lot of Greek philosophy, and we, we tend to forget it. Well, Gavin, as we started our prayer before the show, people didn't get to hear it. We kind of knew it was going to be a good show. It happened to be a good and long show. We're up to 30 minutes, Gavin. We could just talk our heads off, couldn't we? <laughs> Hi, At least Kevin. people know where the, where the pause button is. <laughs> yes, right. I will edit it down to 10 minutes. It'd be just fine. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashton. You've been listening, if I can remember rightly, to episode 340 of Anglican Unscripted. Was it not? <laughs> oh, 430. <laughs> okay, well, right numbers, wrong order. <laughs> You've been listening to episode 430. Well, there's a lot more episodes than I remember. I know. I don't remember doing 430 episodes. Do you? <laughs> 